Good morning. Welcome to worship. Uh, it is uh, it's kind of interesting. Today is um, June 21st. Here we are in the middle of summer. It's June 21st. It's a, it's a special day according to the normal calendar. It's the summer solstice. It's the, the longest day of the year. And you know what that means for us this morning? That means that I get to preach the longest sermon of the year this morning, right? Right. Um, well, I, I, I'll, I'll try not, but I can't make any guarantees. Um, our, our theme this morning during the middle of, of the season of Pentecost, of, of, of green and growing, uh, you find it there in, in your service bulletin, the public ministry preaches in spite of persecution. Uh, in all of our readings this morning, uh, uh, God's word puts us in the shoes or the sandals of prophets and pastors and what it's like to be in their shoes. And so we have a look at, uh, at the public ministry and that it inevitably brings persecution. Uh, the order of service we follow this morning is found in our, in our service bulletins. Uh, we'll begin as printed, um, hymn 346, and I'll be singing that hymn before, before we move into the invocation. <clears throat> In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Dear friends, let us approach God with a true heart and confess our sins, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to forgive us. Lord of life, I confess that I am by nature dead in sin, for faithless worrying and selfish pride, for sins of habit and sins of choice. For the evil I have done and the good I have failed to do, you should cast me away from your presence forever. O oh Lord, I am sorry for my sins. Forgive me for Jesus' sake. Christ has died. 
Christ is risen. Christ will come again. In his great mercy, God made us alive in Christ, even when we were dead in our sins. Hear the word of Christ through his called servant. I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the well-being of all people everywhere, that they may receive from you all they need to sustain body and life, hear our prayer, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the spread of your life-giving gospel throughout the world, that all who are lost in sin may be brought to faith in you, hear our prayer, O Christ. Christ, have mercy. For patience and perseverance in this life, that we may not lose the hope of heaven as we await your return, hear our prayer, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Lord of life, live in us, that we may live for you. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. <clears throat> Let us pray. O Lord our God, govern the nations on earth and direct the affairs of this world so that your church may worship you in peace and in joy. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> Our first reading this morning is taken from the Old Testament prophet of Jeremiah, chapter 20. These words will serve as the basis for our sermon this morning. You deceived me, Lord, and I was deceived. You seized me and prevailed. I am a laughing stock all the time. Everyone ridicules me. For whenever I speak, I cry out. I proclaim violence and destruction. So the word of the Lord has become my constant disgrace and derision. I say, I won't mention him or speak any longer in his name. But his message becomes a fire burning in my heart, shut up in my bones. I become tired of holding it in, and I cannot prevail. For I have heard the gossip of many people. Terror is on every side. Report him. Let's report him. Everyone I trusted watches for my fall. Perhaps he will be deceived, so that we might prevail against him and take our vengeance on him. But the Lord is with me like a violent warrior. Therefore, my persecutors will stumble and will not prevail. Since they have not succeeded, they will be utterly shamed and everlasting humiliation that will never be forgotten. Lord of armies, testing the righteous and seeing the heart and mind, let me see your vengeance on them. For I have presented my case to you. Sing to the Lord, praise the Lord, for he rescues the life of the needy from the evil people. So far, God's word. Our psalm this morning is Psalm 31. Trust in 
in him and not be afraid. For the Lord is my stronghold and my sure defense, and he will be my Savior. My times are in your hands, How great is your goodness! You heard my cry for mercy. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning is now and will be forever Amen Surely it is God who saves me I will trust in him and not be afraid. For the Lord is my stronghold and my sure defense, and he will be my Savior. Our second reading this morning is taken from 2 Timothy chapter 4 verses 1 to 8. When you read 2 Timothy, treat it as as if you are picturing an elderly pastor on his deathbed giving last precious bits of advice to a younger pastor. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you... Keep your head in all situations, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, discharge all the duties of your ministry, for I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time for my departure is near. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all those who have longed for his appearing. So ends our second reading. Alleluia. Because we are his children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father, Alleluia. Alleluia. Faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word of Christ. Alleluia. Please stand out of respect for the gospel of our Lord. The gospel this Sunday is is taken from the gospel according to Matthew chapter 10. Glory be to you, O Lord. These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Brother will betray brother to death and the father his child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. You will be hated by everyone because of me. But but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. When When you are persecuted in one place, flee to another. Truly, I tell you, you will not finish going through the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. The student is not above the teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for students to be like their teachers and servants like their masters. 
If the head of the house has been called Beelzebul, how much more the members of his household? So do not be afraid of them, for there is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. What I tell you in the dark, speak in the daylight. What is whispered in your ear, proclaim from the roofs. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather be afraid of the one who can, who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside of your father's care. And even the very hairs on your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. Whoever acknowledges me before others... I will, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven, but whoever disowns me before others, I will disown before my Father in heaven. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Our hymn of the day is hymn 202, If God Had Not Been On Our Side. <clears throat> Grace and peace to you from God the Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That wasn't on the brochure. Uh, years ago, uh, when we graduated from high school, all of us uh, in, in our high school class you know, kind of took a step back and it was kind of interesting, interesting to see the different paths and directions where, where we went. And years later, uh, there, there's a, a, a couple friends of mine in my high school class, uh, and, and remember I went to a public school back in Montana. It was interesting to see where, where they all ended up. A couple of my friends, they ended up in the military, in, in the Air Force. And one day, uh, the, these two friends, they, they were joking with each other uh, about how really crafty the, the recruiter was. 
You know, because he said, uh, the recruiter said to them, there's no limit, there's no limit to the places and positions that you're going to, that, that you could be. And of course, in a very joking way, looking back, they were like, yeah, there, there were no limits to the places we could go. Uh, we, we could clean out kitchens and we could clean out, you know, bathrooms all across the nation. Um, and the point, of course, was that wasn't in the brochure. Uh, the brochure, as it were, the recruiter promised uh, high, lofty, nothing but fun, nothing but fulfillment, but then all of a sudden you enlist, you join up, and it's not always roses and tulips, is it? That wasn't on the brochure. All of that I mentioned this morning because here in the prophet Jeremiah, we have the opportunity to put ourselves in his sandals, and to recognize what it's like to be a, a prophet or here in the New Testament, a, a pastor for just, just one day, to realize that, you know, when you're going through the seminary, you hear all of these amazing stories, and, and you need to hear those, right? You need to hear the, the professor say to you, you're going to go out and you're going to share God's word to strangers, and you know what, they, uh, they're going to listen, and they're going to want to hear more. And, and you need to hear these examples of where you're going to be sharing God's word with people on their deathbeds, and you're going to be communing them sometimes on their deathbeds and ushering them into heaven. You need to hear that. Why? Because sometimes there are things that happen that are not in the brochure. And so, in Jeremiah chapter 20, we read these words. You deceived me, Lord, and I was deceived. You seized me and prevailed. I am a laughing stock all the time. Everyone ridicules me. For whenever I speak, I cry out. I proclaim violence and destruction. So the word of the Lord has become my constant disgrace and derision. I say I won't mention him or speak any longer in his name. But as the message becomes a fire burning in my heart, shut up in my bones, I become tired of holding it in, and I cannot prevail. In these words, we see Jeremiah in the trenches. We see him offer up to the Lord this very pain-filled plea. He says, O oh Lord, you lied. You deceived me, and I was just stupid enough to go along with you. These are, are shocking words, if you think about it. You have the prophet accusing the almighty, perfect Lord of, of lying. This is the sort of stuff that, you know, if you were a bug, you'd get squashed. Let's put it that way. Now, notice what he uses as evidence. He says, I go out there, and, and I share God's word to the people out there. And what do I face Derision, mocking, they make fun of me all day long. And you think that picture is, is bad, that complaint is bad. What follows is even worse. We read, for I have heard the gossip of many people, terror is on every side, report him, let's report him. Everyone I trusted watches for my fall. Perhaps he will be deceived so that we might prevail against him and take our vengeance on him. The ministry was supposed to be fun. The ministry was supposed to be fulfilling. But as Jeremiah unburdens himself, I guess, as he offers up this pain-filled plea, he realizes the people out there, when he shares God's word, instead of having them invite him to, to their houses to feed him cinnamon rolls and, and, and beg to hear more of God's word, what happens? What happens? They make fun of him all day long. But then as he changes gears in the next section, then notice what happens. It's not just the, the people on the outside that Jeremiah had, had difficulties with. It was the people on the inside, too. Jeremiah uses a very interesting word here. Uh, it's the word that describes wholeness and completeness and welfare and protection and health. 
All that is wrapped up in, into the word. <clears throat> he says, uh, you know, those whom I trusted turn their backs against me and, and are waiting for my fall. Uh, the idea then is, is um, there were these people placed in Jeremiah's life, and he knew their names. And they were put in, in his life to watch over him, to take care of him. They were put in his life so that he would be able to trust them. And instead, what happened? These caregivers became, in a sense, backstabbers. True. And it's always been that way. Always. Ancient Moses, um, his real difficulties, his real challenges, wasn't with Pharaoh, and it wasn't with you know, Pharaoh in the south or with the Moabites in the north. The real challenge he faced for all, you know, for 40 years of ministry was his own people. The people that were placed in his, in his life to take care of him. You, you think of Jesus' words here that we read in our gospel for this morning where Jesus says, brother will betray brother to death. Notice he doesn't say, the people out there are going to be you know, trying to, to, to get to you. No, he says, your own family members. The people that are put in your life to watch over you and take care of you, those are the people that are going to lash out against you. And that's what life can be like as a, a prophet or a pastor, as we, we put ourselves in, in their shoes. And it's always been that way. It's always been that way. And it's true today as well. Uh, what happens is uh, there, there are challenges and changes that come into a congregation's life. That's the first step. And the second step then is the congregation then, and, and the members in the congregation think to themselves, what are we going to do about this? How do I understand this challenge, and, and how, do I, how do I fix it? And then what happens is, is they remember bits and pieces and snippets of God's Word, and they apply it to the situation. And the problem, though, is what they need is not just little tiny snippets, but huge, massive, all the context of God's Word to bring to the challenge. It happens all the time in churches. It can be uh, something as, as big as building a new building. It can be something as small as changing the color of a carpet. But when there are these changes, that's what happens. And if you want an example, let's use our current example that we're, we're all wrestling with, and not just us here, but all Christian con congregations across the world. Uh, um, six months ago, who knew that we'd be speaking about this, right? Right? But notice what happens. There's this huge change that comes into our lives. There's this big virus. And now we're trying to wrestle with what to do about it. And what can happen then is we have the real temptation uh, uh, to apply a tiny bit of God's word and, and not all of it. And so there's, a, for example, there might be a faction over here that says God has given to us commandments and he wants us to obey them. There's the fourth commandment. Uh, God has put in representatives, and we're supposed to obey them as long as they're not asking us to go against God's word. And so there are rules, there are strictures, and, and he wants us to follow them. There's the fifth commandment. You shall not murder, and we remember Luther's explanation. We should fear and love God that we do not hurt or harm our neighbor in his body, but help and befriend him in every bodily need, Right? And how scary it is to think that, you know, with this virus, I could have the virus, be speaking to someone else, one of my congregational members, infect them without even knowing it. It's scary. And, and the trap we can fall into is if we just look at the fact that God has given to us commandments, we overlook the real, also the other fact that there are dangers all around us. As we sing in the hymn, I walk in danger all the way. And at the risk of exaggerating, uh, we can arrive at a conclusion if we go too far down this road that we conclude that, you know, I'm not going to come to church unless people there take a, you know, a shower in bleach and have a, a you know, a hunter safety orange colored hazmat suit from head to toe. Then and only then I'm going to make it to church. That's one difficulty. 
The other temptation uh, that's a real temptation we can fall into on the other side is to say the words, and the true words, that God is in control. But the challenge comes is when we apply those words that God is in control and, and that's all that we look at is, is the fact that God is in control. Because the Bible also talks about not just the fact that God is in control, but we also need to strive to obey these fourth and fifth commandments. And it's a real danger. And by the way, it's nothing new in the history of the church. Let me give you just one example of where it's such a danger to, to bring in the words, God is in control, he knows what's going on, God is in control, and, and that's all that we, we apply. Um, many years ago, they had these things called the Crusades, um, and it's a whole lot to speak about, but in the southern part of Europe, they had these crusades, and, and they weren't good. They, they were bad examples from history. And what happened is, is there were, um, in these villages in southern Europe, there were anti-Trinitarian, anti-Christian groups that were, were rising up. And then the, the, um, the leaders in the church said to the, the government at that time, you got to get rid of them. You've got to get rid of them. The difficulty then is, is the, the generals then went to the theologians of the day who were really the ones who were calling the shots. And again, this is not a good example. It's sad to say. Um, and, and they said, how are we going to know? How are we going to know that uh, uh, which are the bad guys and which are the good guys, which are the anti-Trinitarians and which are the Christians? You know, how are we going to know? And the theologians, they thought about it, about it for a tiny bit and they said, God knows those who are his own. God is in control. And what then did the generals then tell the troops? Kill them all and let God sort them out. And so they did. Now, you might say to yourselves, wait a minute, wait a minute. That's a bizarre example because uh, how is it saying that God is in control is, is, is then all of a sudden we're at the point where we're saying kill them all and let God sort them out. It's the same starting place. If all we know is that God is in control and we set aside our role and responsibility as people who are called on to zealously look at the Ten Commandments and obey them, then we set ourselves on the same path. No, we're not at the stage where we're saying kill them all and let God sort them out. But we're, we're putting ourselves on the first steps toward that. So notice then where we're at here. To back up a tiny bit, change comes into a church. It's a challenge. The people then wrestle with what to do with, with, with it. And, and instead of applying all of God's word, they have little tiny bits from their memories that they apply. But there is a third step. And that's where we're going to get back to Jeremiah here real quick. Is The third step then is if people are on this side, I'm not going to come to church unless you're, you, you wear a hazmat suit. Or on this side, I'm not going to come to church unless you take off all the, all the ropes on the pews and we can sing with full voice. I'm not going to come to church and, Pastor, I want you to, to do what I say. Then what happens? Then we end up where Jeremiah is. And when I say we, what I mean is, is the pastor. The pastor then has a hard time sleeping at night because he offers up pleas like Jeremiah did. Oh, Lord, you lied. You said there would be fun. You said there would be fulfillment in the public ministry as, as being a prophet. But instead, what happens? My caregivers, my, my congregation, they're arm-twisting me in, 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 the, in, in the places and arenas that God's Word doesn't want us to go. That wasn't in the brochure. What then does the Lord say in response to all of this? We read, <clears throat> but the Lord is with me like a violent warrior. Therefore, my persecutors will stumble and not prevail. Since they have not succeeded, they will be utterly ashamed and everlasting humiliation that will never be forgotten. Lord of armies, testing the righteous and seeing the heart and mind, let me see your vengeance on them, for I have presented my case to you. Jeremiah has this pain-filled plea. And you'll notice the Lord doesn't really address it. 
at least in the way that Jeremiah uh, presents it. Uh, uh, the Lord, instilling, instead of telling Jeremiah what he wants to hear, he tells Jeremiah what he needs to hear. Uh, uh, the, the, Jeremiah has this pain-filled plea, Oh, Lord, you lied. And the Lord g- then gives two promises. Number one, he says, I will repay. I will repay. You, you see, um, one of the reasons why it's so tempting to glom on to the idea that God is in control is we have to admit it's, there's fear there. If the government comes along and says, you've got to rope off these pews and you've got to wear this mask, where's it going to stop? Right? And there might be a time, a year, five years, ten years down the road, That is going to be real persecution against us Christians. And let me give you an example of what that might look like. Um, A couple days ago, just a couple days ago, the Supreme Court handed a ruling. And in the ruling, they said it was wrong to, to use their words to discriminate against transgender people. And you think that through for a tiny bit. Uh, The Supreme Court has now said that, for example, if there is a, um, a high school student who is a male and he then identifies as being a female, he then, by law, has to be allowed into girls' locker rooms and even be allowed to compete in girls' track and field. And we're thinking to ourselves, how have we arrived at this point? And then if you, if you carry the ball down the road even a little bit farther, what happens? You're thinking, well, we're not allowed to discriminate against transgendered people. Do realize who might be the next target. Where on a given Sunday morning are people taught as an authoritative true, and, and, um, true fact that there's such a thing as male and female and there's no third alternative and God is the one who gives you your maleness or your femaleness when you, when you, when you, when you come into this world in the Bible. And there might come a time that there's sizable substantive persecution against us. And when you think about that, it makes your blood boil, it makes you angry, and you think to yourself, who's going to get even? Who's going to pay back? And there in Jeremiah, you get your answer, don't you? The Lord says, I will repay. And notice the picture that, that Jeremiah uses. He says, what is the Lord pictured like in these words? A violent and vicious warrior. And the thought is simply this, the Lord will do his work of vengeance perfectly and justly and fairly. And when you take a step back and you think about that for a tiny bit, that fills us with calm. Maybe not right away, but it fills us with calm. Because when there are these times that we face persecution, possible for persecution, and our brothers and sisters across the world as Christians are facing vicious persecution, how wonderful it is to know that the Lord will repay. We can't get rid of whoever's on the Supreme Court. They're appointed there, and you can't unelect them, right? But God can see that justice is done, and he will. I will repay. And again, what that does is that fills us with with peace, to know that we don't need to worry about being, you know, the maverick, vigilante justice sort of person and exacting of violence and justice because the Lord is going to do that. So the Lord responds, first of all, with a promise, a promise, and he says, I will repay. He's in control. But he also then finally responds with a different promise, and this is where we will conclude this morning. He says, sing to the Lord, praise the Lord, for he rescues the life of the needy from evil people. So the Lord doesn't just repay, what does he also do? He redeems, he rescues. The pastor that that goes to sleep at night or tries to 
And he offers up a a, a pain-filled plea, saying to his Lord above, these people in the pews, they're supposed to be my caregivers, but they're my backstabbers. Lord, what are you going to do about that? What he needs is, is repentance. That's what a pastor who says that needs. And he needs forgiveness. A pastor who comes along and says, Oh Lord, you deceived me. Uh, you, 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 you told me it would be this way and I was just dumb enough to believe you. That pastor needs repentance, just like Jeremiah did. And the Lord gives that pastor repentance and forgiveness, won by Jesus' blood. And the congregation of caregivers to the pastor, they too need that as well. It reminds me of when I was a child and every now and then, then like all of you as well, um, I'd get sick and I remember like getting a, a stomach flu and, and mom out of love for me, what would she do? She would take off time from work and she'd, she'd help me and as I was there hanging out in the bathroom and, and whatever was in my stomach didn't stay there and I would be so lost and so afraid and so frustrated that I be lashing out, but mom was an easy, easy target because I could see her and I'd get angry at her and I'd say mean things against her. And a congregation can do that too against their pastor. And a congregation then needs repentance and forgiveness. And that's what these words promise. That when there are those times when we might lash out with words that we haven't really thought through as well as we should have, what forgiveness there is there. And not just forgiveness, but also then protection and oversight. God cares for us. So Jesus says in the opening words of our gospel, he says, brother will betray brother to death, but then he closes. And I always, I always picture this. Whenever I'm fearful and anxious, I picture the words of Jesus where he says that he has counted every hair on our heads. I remember years ago, I made the mistake of saying in a sermon, I said, do you know how many hairs there are on your head? Thinking, you know, of course, I knew the answer. And then after, after the service, there was an elderly man that came up to me and said, I know how many hairs there are on my head. I'm, I'm bald, so I know, I know that answer pretty clearly, right? We don't know the answer, typically speaking. But God does. And isn't it amazing that the same Savior who said, brother will betray brother to death, also says he has all the hairs of your head counted. And and there's this amazing argument from the lesser to the greater that that if he is so zealous and, and, and picky about counting all the hairs on your head that you have no idea about, how much more so will he be concerned about all the, the cares and concerns and frustrations and fears in your soul? Won't he also then watch out for the church and prophets and pastors in the church when they are persecuted? Won't he also then take care of your bodies whether you fall down and get hurt or, or, or someone hurts you? He will. He has promised to. And so these words start out with a whole lot of pain, don't they? It's kind of one of these things you start out this morning and the pastor says, we get to put ourselves in the sandals of being a pastor. And you're like, oh, great. I get to see what it's like to go and share God's word and have people say amen. You know, I'll I'll give you donuts and cinnamon rolls and in, in exchange you can give me all of God. It doesn't always work that way, does it? Being a pastor, just as in your own lives, in your own vocations and callings, it's not always easy. And that's why we need parts of God's word like this. That's why when the pastor is frustrated and he says, that wasn't on the brochure, you lied. He needs forgiveness. And that's when there are those times when in weakness a congregation, you know, um, might lash out against the pastor they're there to care, to care for. They need forgiveness, and that's what we have. We have all of that in Christ. And so, Jeremiah starts out by saying, Oh, Lord, you lied. And he gives him, and he responds, not by telling Jeremiah what he wants to hear, but what he needs to hear. Promise number one, and you know what I'm going to say, right? Promise number one, the Lord says, I will repay. How calming and comforting, comforting that is for us. Promise number two, he says, I will redeem. And what an amazing privilege it is for me to say to you, 
the Lord forgives you. And what an amazing privilege it is for you to be able to say to me, the Lord forgives you. Amen. Please stand. And the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. We'll continue this morning with our prayers. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, our strength and our stay, you uphold all creation by your power, sustaining the earth and its inhabitants by your love and enlightening the hearts of your children by your truth. We acknowledge your mercy in bringing us from death to life by the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ, your Son, and by the power of his resurrection. Give us, O Father, the spirit of your love, that loving you above all things, we may also love one another in deed and in truth. Lord God of hosts, rule over our nation and sanctify all to whom you have committed authority. Refine our society by giving it purity of motive, nobleness of purpose, and strength of character. Bless our homes that they may be schools of true wisdom and havens of true love. May all who abide there find peace and joy in harmony with you and with one another. All this we ask in your name and continue with the prayer you have taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Please be seated. We conclude this morning uh, with that last hymn, hymn 419, of God himself before me. Nice.
Good morning. Uh, a couple of announcements then to bring to your attention. We're um, working hard to try to figure out a, a stable path, <clears throat> both for our worship in the future, um, and it's nice to be able to see you here now week after week after week uh, um, doing things that you're not used to doing, you know, wearing masks and sitting in roped off pews and such. Uh, we're also trying to figure out the same then uh, uh, path and forward when it comes to our Bible studies. So we're going to have Bible study um, today. We're going to be inside here, uh, um, and that'll be at 10.30 um, a.m. Okay, that does give us some time. The sermon was not that long. Um, uh, uh, so uh, uh, Bible study at 10.30. If, if uh, we get all of our stuff set up, we'll start a little bit early. Um, so I invite you to come to that Bible study this morning. We're going to be talking about um, creationism and evolutionism. Um, uh, what does the Bible say about how God created us? And what does that mean for us in our, in our everyday life? Uh, um, you know, so that's our Bible study here this morning. Uh, if you would like to come to Bible study, you've got options. You know, um, after our service is done, you can be ushered out, um, and then you can come back to the pews that you were in because you've already, you know, staked them and claimed them as your own, and, and, and those germs are now your germs in the pew. Um, however, if you notice, there are some empty seats up here. Um, the pews will be having our Bible study up in front, and if you want to come to Bible study, instead of sitting in, in your own pew that you were in for worship, you can come and, and sit in, um, in some of these pews where nobody sat in, and, and that'll work out really well. Um, go ahead and take your bulletins with you on your way out. Um, uh, uh, that'll help us when it comes to cleaning up as well. Let's see, what, else, what other announcements are there? Um, our confirmation service is coming up on Wednesday night at 7 p.m. Uh, uh, please keep our confirmands in your prayers. It's just, it, just as weird as, it, as it's been for, for you, it's also been weird for them. They had their examination some weeks ago, and they, they did so very well. Um, but also then uh, we have our confirmation service, and that'll be coming up then on, on Wednesday evening at 7 p.m. Uh, keep Pastor Paul Meitner in your prayers. The time is, is coming soon on July 12th uh, when... Um, when he will be coming here and he'll be installed there at 4 p.m. over at Zion in Winthrop. Uh, and finally then, um, I thank you for your patience uh, during all these difficulties we've been walking through. Uh, please keep those who for health concerns and reasons are not able to be with us this morning, keep them in your prayers and give them a call and encourage them if you're able. Uh, and, and take to heart what Jeremiah says uh, to the Lord, O oh, Lord, you lied. Um, and notice the very amazing answer that the Lord gives. Two promises. Number one, I will repay, says the Lord. And number two, the Lord says, I will redeem you. And so he has. May the Lord bless you. And if, if you're uh, having a hard time sleeping tonight on this long day of the year and it's like 11 o'clock at night and the sun still is not going down, uh, God's word is always a good place to turn to to, to, to meditate and grow in. May the Lord bless you. Amen.